So welcome to this environmental uh, research seminar series, uh, which is sponsored by NIEHS funded uh, Michigan Center on Life Stage Environmental Exposures and Disease, uh, also known as MLEAD. So I'm very glad to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Uh, Kimberly Mackey. So Dr. Mackey is, is uh, assistant professor at Department of uh, Family Medicine, uh, UM Medical School. So she received a, a bachelor degree from College of the Holy Cross and MPH and PhD from the University of Rochester. So Dr. Mackey is the uh, currently the principal investigator of a study on the maternal vaginal microbiome titled Validation of Maternal Vaginal Microbiota Signatures in Pregnancy, the ECHO Vaginal Microbiome Consortium, which is also funded by NIH and the uh, ECHO Opportunities and Infrastructure Fund. So this, uh, as many of you know, this environmental influences on child health outcome, also known as ECHO, is a NIH funded project to investigate how exposure to a wide range of environmental factors in early development influence the health of children and adolescents. So Dr. Mack is, is funded research assess the maternal microbiome in pregnancy and its association with, uh, uh, with birth and infant outcome. She's also a co-investigator of a statewide cohort study that is part of the ECHO longitudinal study of maternal and child health across a range of exposures and child health outcome. So uh, before I turn uh, this to uh, Dr. Mackey, so if you have any question, please use the chat box and then put your uh, question. And then uh, after, at the end of her presentation, and then we will open the discussion. So please join me to welcome uh, Dr. Mackey. Thanks so much for the opportunity to present on this topic and some of the work that we're doing uh, within ECHO, both locally and nationally. Um, today, I'll talk um, mostly about the vaginal microbiota because that's mostly what I've been studying. Um, I'll touch a little bit on the gut and the placental microbiome um, because they're um, uh, often um, studied um, in pregnancy in conjunction with the vaginal microbiota. And I'll wrap up with some implications for child health and some of our current work in ECHO. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. Um, but first, just some um, terminology as I go through the talk. So we're talking about the microbiome. We're talking about the total community of microbes, so both bacteria as well as fungi and viruses in a given environment. Uh, microbiota refers strictly to the communities of microbes in a given niche um, or environment. Um, the trillions of microbes that uh, reside uh, within and among us, create these vast ecosystems we're appreciating um, from um, both culture uh, studies and culture independent methods that have become more feasible um, and efficient uh, for population-based studies. And we're kind of shifting our thinking from thinking strictly about microbes from a kind of a pathogenic uh, perspective and, and beyond Cox Poxalates into thinking about their essential roles in um, health maintenance. Um, and so um, some of the ways in which we can interrogate um, these um, uh, DNA sequencing platforms of the microbiota are to characterize both their composition or their structure um, in which we can uh, describe specific taxa or community types. Um, so kind of enterotype or um, the diversity and richness of different communities. And depending on the niche, diversity is either um, associated with positive health or um, risk for disease um, or um, stability. So the dynamics across time um, are also thought to play a role in health maintenance. Um, and then depending on the methods, um, things like metagenomics can also address the function of these microbes. Um, and so specifically when we think about the maternal microbiome, um, it's important to consider not just um, the niche, um, which as I mentioned, most of the talk today will be about the vaginal microbiome, um, as well as um, touching on the gut and the uh, highly debated, I would say, placenta microbiome. Um, but others have also looked at the oral uh, microbiota and skin microbiota. 
um, and in terms of their effect on vertical transmission. Um, the other important dimension I would say when thinking about the microbiome in pregnancy is the time scale. And so different points of gestation and in early life, um, these different components and niches um, may play um, particularly important and salient roles in offspring um, microbiota and, and health. Um, and so uh, what we know about the vaginal microbiota of reproductive age women um, from studies like the Human Microbiome Project are that most communities are lactobacillus dominant. Um, this has um, really confirmed prior um, work using culture, um, but that stability um, is evident both within and across women that variation is normal, but highly dynamic communities, we think, um, confer risk of disease. Um, these are thought to be hormonally regulated. So Kayla Carter, who is a Mac Epid student a few years ago, um, worked with us to create these plots in which each square is one woman that she followed across multiple menstrual cycles. Um, and then she embedded color in those um, plots to um, demonstrate the different community types and um, the changes which are on the y-axis in the communities over time. And you can see that some communities, principally um, the red lactobacillus dominant communities um, are very stable, very little changes occurred throughout those cycles in those women who were dominant in those taxa. Um, whereas others, the lactobacillus inners dominant communities um, embedded in blue, uh, were more dynamic. And then other women had um, more polymicrobial or more diverse communities. Um, and so the principal function uh, we think of the vaginal microbiota um, is the production of lactic acid, hydrogen peroxide, and other metabolites that acidify the vaginal environment. And um, this is thought to um, either directly or indirectly inhibit infections um, and kind of work in concert with uh, the host immune system. Um, we know from prior work that lactobacillus depletion has been linked to um, bacterial vaginosis and acquisition of both STIs and HIV. Um, from other studies, uh, we know that the vaginal microbiota in pregnancy is thought to support both pregnancy maintenance um, and as well as the promotion of the transfer of specific microbes to the infant, so kind of vertical transmission. Um, from um, healthy gravid women, um, these communities appear fairly stable with um, some shifts in the proliferation of lactobacilli. Um, our group was interested in whether this varied by um, species or type of community um, and whether or not there was um, a threshold effect um, and how early in gestation um, these uh, changes um, may be evident and whether um, kind of um, differences um, by pregnancy outcome um, could be tied to early pregnancy, which would be important for restratification. Um, in terms of uh, what we know about how the vaginal microbiota may associate with an outcome like preterm birth, um, uh, less than 37 weeks, for a long time, uh, there's been a well-established role of infection, um, especially among women with spontaneous preterm births, which are thought to be ideologically distinct from indicated preterm births, which occur mainly in the setting of preeclampsia or other disorders um, that may have a non-infectious uh, pathway um, in their ideology. Um, we know that conditions like bacterial vaginosis um, may increase risk of preterm birth up to threefold, um, but that um, you know, uh, randomized clinical trials um, for um, administration of antibiotics to prevent preterm birth have not been successful. And in fact, the US Preventative Task Force does not recommend the treatment of BV in pregnancy, um, except for very limited cases. Um, a lot of this work and a lot of these estimates have been limited by um, um, work that has been done in culture. And so um, we are now at a time when we can use and couple next generation sequencing to better understand um, um, the entire suite of microbes that may be present in these communities. Um, and uh, with the goal really of, of um, identifying more viable targets for research um, that may be more amenable, as I said, to either risk stratification or potentially to intervention. Um, and so one of the um, first papers to really look at uh, whether the kind of global uh, community state types of the vaginal microbiome um, may associate with preterm birth was done by um, Degulio et al. from Stanford. And here you can see that um, the, this kind of very diverse uh, community type state four, which is in pink, um, had a 
had a much larger proportion of preterm births, which is the very top row, so the, the dark and light pink uh, uh, subjects. Um, but we can also see that among women that had a uh, community state type dominant in Lactobacillus crispatus, which are thought to be you know, very healthy kind of stable communities, um, there were still women that went on to have, um, in some cases, although a lower proportion of uh, preterm births in, in among women with that particular community type. Um, this study, I should mention, um, did not look at other um, factors and, and uh, characteristics of the population. Um, so there was no adjustment for um, any potential confounders in this, in this quite small study. Um, and in fact, there have been um, some subsequent studies that have actually not been able to replicate these findings, um, but none of these studies have been able to um, address potential confounders or differences in the cohorts um, which has led to some of the current work that we're doing in ECHO, um, where we're attempting to pool data across cohorts. Um, and one of the complications um, when we're looking across cohorts and across studies in this area is that um, there have been very um, evident compositional differences in the vaginal microbiota um, across racial and ethnic groupings. Um, so you can see here in the figure, women of European ancestry, which is depicted in the, the lower plot, um, had a higher proportion of Lactobacillus crispatus dominant community types and other Lactobacillus dominant communities um, compared to women of African American descent, um, which had um, more diverse kind of polymicrobial community uh, dominance, dominance in their communities, as well as um, uh, communities dominant in things like Garnerilla. Uh, which are known pathogens and associated with um, bacterial vaginosis. The major question here is whether these actually um, confer real risk um, for disease and whether they matter in terms of outcomes when we're thinking about pre an outcome like preterm birth. Um, so Ben Callahan and his colleagues um, took uh, the um, data from the Stanford cohort, um, which is depicted in the, the uh, boxes across the top in this plot, and tried to replicate those signatures when they looked across three principal taxa, Lactobacillus, um, Gardnerella, and Uroplasma, which are associated with, as I mentioned, bacterial vaginosis and kind of these polymicrobial states, um, and compared them to a cohort black women from Alabama. And what he found was that while there were distinct microbial signatures that associated with preterm birth in each of the cohorts independently, um, they, didn't, they were not the same across cohorts. Um, and so these findings, while difficult to compare, I think, um, because there wasn't any consideration for underlying differences um, with regard to risk or demographics in these two cohorts um, make them difficult to compare, but they're important to consider when thinking about pooling studies and data um, across cohorts, um, which has led to some of the work that we're doing now, which I'll um, discuss uh, at the end of the talk. Um, but while we were doing that, we conducted um, a, um, study at the University of Michigan OBGYN clinics where we enrolled pregnant women um, and non -pregnant, uh, also a sample of non-pregnant women um, to look at this question of how early in pregnancy we could tie signatures in the vaginal microbiota um, to actual outcomes like preterm birth. Um, we use self-collected vaginal swabs that we collected longitudinally in pregnancy, um, as well as um, a lot of other information um, from both um, charts and uh, survey data, um, as well as uh, in inflammatory markers that we're just now beginning to characterize. Um, this was a, um, a fairly high risk cohort, about 16% of the sample did have a preterm birth. Um, before 37 weeks. Um, we used um, 16S rRNA gene amplicon sequencing um, to uh, basically uh, sequence the V4 region um, on the Illumina MySeq platform. We uh, used mother software um, to align uh, the sequences and trim them, and then bin sequences based on 97% sequence similarity, which is um, subgenus or roughly species level resolution. Um, it's not quite. Um, and then um, calculated global measures of community similarity or dissimilarity, um, depending on the metric that you use um, to then cluster these sequences into um, community state types. Um, and what we found 
um, when we separated out women with spontaneous preterm births here in the middle plot compared to women who were either not pregnant on the right or who went on to have a term birth or an idiopathic or uh, indicated preterm birth, excuse me, was that the women with spontaneous preterm births had a larger proportion of this diverse uh, de lactobacillus deplete uh, community types. Um, although, you know, you can still see that, that, that there were women um, that had term births that, you know, certainly did have um, a, a diverse community type, but um, as a group, on average, the women with spontaneous preterm births um, more closely resembled um, the non-pregnant women in terms of um, kind of the, the degree to which their uh, communities uh, were dominant in lactobacillus. And in fact, uh, differences were apparent very early in pregnancy. We could tie uh, differences in uh, pregnancy as early as 17 weeks gestation um, with notable enrichment and of uh, lactobacillus gasseri uh, specifically uh, among the pregnant women compared to the non-pregnant women um, and uh, uh, comparatively more lactobacillus inners and gardnerella in our non-pregnant cohort um, compared to those women uh, who were pregnant um, with under 14 weeks gestation. Um, and this suggests really that early pregnancy may be this kind of critical period um, for priming the vaginal microbiota or this, this vaginal microbiota shift that may be really important uh, for pregnancy maintenance. We also, when we looked across gestation, so beyond the first trimester, um, that overall kind of globally, the women uh, with those spontaneous preterm births here in the lighter blue um, did have more instability kind of globally in their communities. Um, this didn't quite meet significance in our somewhat small sample, um, but you can definitely see the trend. The miscarriage group is, is quite a small group, so kind of don't don't take that with uh, take that with kind of a grain of salt, and not really would hang my hat on that. But um, in general, you can see that you know there's there's this kind of trend towards greater instability. But was what was perhaps more remarkable um, in our data was that when we looked specifically at the relative abundance of two key taxa, so Lactobacillus crispatus, which is this plot on the left, which as I mentioned is associated with kind of stability and health in the vaginal niche. Um, for women who had term births here in the red, they had kind of, they mounted this nice um, increase in uh, lactobacillus crispatus um, across gestation. And we kind of, and we did not see that trend um, in women with spontaneous preterm births who um, you can see kind of fluctuated um, in the amount of lactobacillus crispatus uh, in their communities. And the converse was true for lactobacillus inners, which is this kind of uh, more uh, dynamic uh, community type, um, which uh, was uh, much more, um, uh, which fluctuated quite a bit uh, and among our women with preterm birth. Um, and there was a decrease in relative abundance of lactobacillus inners among women with uh, term births in our cohort. Um, we used uh, multivariate zero inflated long normal models to look at more rare taxa, um, potentially those that may be pathogens or other kind of action kind of in uh, the less common uh, taxa. Um, and we noted um, several taxa that were more enriched among women with spontaneous preterm births. Some of these um, are known pathogens, um, so protovella, atobium, things that are consistent with uh, BV or kind of these polymicrobial states. Um, things that you know form potential um, biofilms, um, as well as lactobacillus inners, those kind of at-risk uh, type of taxa, as well as our um, top hit, which we initially um, uh, thought may have been similar to some of the uh, novel bacterial vaginosis-associated bacteria that have uh, been published in the last uh, 10 years or so, um, but it was only 94% similar to the closest hit um, and suggesting that it, it's probably distinct, um, but that there is a lack of um, uh, identification and curation in our reference databases for some of these more rare vaginal taxa, um, which has been a kind of a challenge, I would say, in this area. 
Um, we also uh, examine factors that may structure the vaginal microbiota in pregnancy, and we've kind of grouped them according to, um, you know, we, we looked at everything from demographics to clinical, you know, risk factors. Uh, we even had some psychosocial um, scales that we employed, as well as medications, because we know from the gut microbiome literature that those can be important drivers or levers of community structure, um, and then diet. Um, and you can see uh, in these Permanova models that um, some of the factors that explain the largest amount of variation in uh, vaginal microbiota uh, structure uh, were things like progesterone, um, antibiotic use, um, uh, you know, which corroborated um, kind of known factors such as race and education, actually, um, and preterm birth, which are kind of known risk factors for um, an outcome like preterm birth. Um, but that also, interestingly, a vegetarian diet, but not vegan diet. Uh, was uh, responsible for a large amount of variation in um, the microbiota. And our thinking, we have not corroborated this, but we're trying to look with some of our um, echo data, is that perhaps it has to do with um, antibiotics in meat products that may not be present in other, uh, say, dietary sources, uh, such as or the protective effects of yogurt. Um, but we're, uh, we're, we're looking into this in a more nuanced way in our current work. Um, and so that leads me to some of the work that we're doing with an echo. Um, and Dr. Park um, really nicely introduced this trans NIH um, program that is looking um, very broadly at some major domains of child health, including preterm birth, which is most of the space that I work in, but also um, common childhood outcomes like obesity, uh, airway disease, neurodevelopment, and then more recently, positive health has been added as an outcome. Um, and this is, um, a cohort of what will become about 50,000 children in about 40 sites uh, nationwide, including a, a clinical trials network. Um, we've had the pleasure and the privilege to uh, basically uh, get additional funding to characterize both vaginal and fecal microbiota in our pregnant moms that we've recruited um, both at the University of Michigan, uh, as well as uh, nine other states. Uh, sites in the state of Michigan that makes up the population-based sample um, in uh, the uh, new uh, cohort in Michigan, which is led by Nigel Paneth. Um, we also in Michigan have a extant uh, cohort. Those children are about, uh, I think, seven to age 10 right now, but we have maternal samples from many of them. Um, that my colleague uh, has actually collected microbiota samples and done sequencing on. Um, and we're also looking at, we've um, been using um, actually a special preservative um, to include um, inflammatory markers, but also proteomics and hopefully transcript omics in these samples um, that we're just uh, beginning to analyze. <laughs> so we've got lots of data. And this is augmented, of course, by um, the really rich uh, surveying clinical data that already exists within the ECHO-wide protocol. Um, and so one of the first things that we've been able to look at while we were waiting for other data to accrue with an echo um, was um, with my colleague, Christine Basis in um, internal medicine and microbiology was to look at the overlap between the vaginal and fecal microbiota um, in pregnant women specifically, um, because we know these two niches are important from um, in both pregnancy and um, at delivery. Um, and we're asked this all the time in terms of what, you know, what may be a reservoir for what. Um, and so Christine created this nice heat map where we paired the vaginal and fecal um, specimens from each woman on the left and then used um, yellow to show um, which overlapped. And most of the overlap occurred in lactobacillus. Um, we're not sure yet. Um, if these, so this is based on OTU or 97% sequence similarity. Our next step is to um, look at exact sequence variants to get better resolution to hopefully address whether these are actual bacterial strains that may be overlapping um, because at this level of resolution, it's not, it's a little hand wavy, I would say. Um, so that's kind of what we're working on right now. Um, it's also not clear if these associate or are important for um, actual outcomes. Um, but in terms of whether the gut could be a reservoir for um, deplete or loss vaginal microbiota, um, you know, it's really not clear yet, um, but that's something that we've been working on. Um, the other thing that I would touch on here is that we know that 
there is significant maternal host remodeling of the gut microbiota in pregnancy. Um, and the goal is, or the purpose we think, is to support metabolic changes and weight gain. Um, and so uh, there have been several studies that have compared third trimester stool from pregnant women, um, showing that they're associated with um, greater inflammation and energy content compared to first trimester fecal microbiota. Um, these are changes that are consistent with a kind of uh, metabolic syndrome in uh, non-pregnant uh, individuals. Um, there's been a study that has even transplanted third trimester fecal microbiota into germ-free mice and showing that uh, changes were evident in both insulin resistance and adiposity uh, in these mice compared to mice transplanted with first trimester microbiota. And the thinking in th is that this is consistent with the physiologic changes that are necessary to support uh, fetal growth, which principally happens in the second and third trimester. Um, and so we know from um, Maria Dominguez Bello's kind of landmark study demonstrating the importance of delivery mode at birth um, on infant microbiota in terms of how um, it may begin. Uh, and that um, vaginally delivered children um, at birth have a microbiota uh, that largely matches their mother's vaginal microbiota compared to children who are born by C-section whose microbiota largely resembles their mother's skin microbiota. Um, the other important driver in uh, uh, infant microbiota in early life is uh, infant diet, um, both uh, whether or not they're breastfed, and then later on the uh, adoption of solid foods we're beginning to understand is another important driver. Um, but my uh, March collaborator Sarah Comstock at MSU has used some of our data that we've collected to look at um, maternal pre-pregnancy uh, BMI um, and its association with both maternal gut microbiota as well as infant microbiota in the first week of life and has showed that there are um, you know, definite differences across those uh, BMI pre-pregnancy groupings um, that we think may be important for um, child health. We're now uh, looking at longitudinal samples of those children, um, but she has been able to so far replicate um, the differences um, by delivery mode that we see in infant gut microbiota, as well as um, breastfeeding. There is some sense that um, in her data that um, breastfeeding may moderate this effect of maternal pre-pregnancy BMI, um, but we're um, still analyzing some of those data. So I would say, <laughs> um, hold on to that. Um, but um, she and uh, another colleague at MSU have actually been looking at um, use of antibiotics uh, in pregnancy and early life and demonstrated that these also, um, not surprisingly, but I think importantly for thinking about judicious use of antibiotics in pregnancy, because um, we're seeing a lot of women taking a lot of things, including a lot of antibiotics, um, that these do have uh, drive kind of really large global differences in the gut microbiota of kids in early life. Um, there have also been <coughs> more recently, some nice work looking at this question of how far out we can we can see vertical transmission of infant microbiota and uh, micro, microbiota that are, are more stable colonizers. Um, so this paper has paired um, metagenomic sequencing um, across different uh, maternal niches with um, infant microbiota out to four months, um, because previously we've been looking just um, right after birth. Um, and um, demonstrated um, very nicely, I think, that early microbial diversity um, is, rapidly uh, is rapidly shaped by niche selection, um, and that most of uh, our gut microbiota actually comes from our maternal comes from maternal gut microbiota, which I thought was really interesting. Um, there is some effect. Um, that we see if, if kids are vaginally delivered from their maternal uh, vaginal microbiota, but that appears to be um, in some ways more uh, transi transitory. Um, and so it, this has yet to be replicated, um, but I think that this is um, a really nice paper and um, one that we will continue to look at as we go forward and look at uh, multiple cohorts in ECHO.
Um, so one of the other things that we've done with Christine and colleagues here at University of Michigan um, was the question of the origin of the vaginal microbiota. And while more attention has been paid to where uh, we get our gut microbiota from, um, our group in particular was interested in the origins of the vaginal microbiota and looking um, at mode of delivery. Um, and this was a very small sample. It's actually difficult to get these samples um, in um, children um, for obvious reasons. Um, but Christine uh, Basis and her um, team actually collected samples from daughters who were in ad adolescence um, out to age 20 and demonstrated that among daughters who were vaginally delivered, um, which are the first seven rows of this heat map, um, which she's paired together in their dyads, there's a remarkable similarity out to age 20 in these women and their vaginal microbiota compared to daughters born by C-section, which um, didn't resemble their mother's vaginal microbiota um, in, in quite the same way. Um, and this, you know, considered whether or not there was um, uh, sexual debut in the daughters, the, the reproductive stage of the mothers um, and the daughters. Um, and she really uh, nicely coupled this with some culture uh, work that she did from isolates from one of the um, dyads that was had lactobacillus dominance in its community type, and then paired it and created this parsimony tree um, based on um, SNPs and genome sequences from NCBI and demonstrated here. You can see it in this, uh, the, the mother, daughter in the pink, uh, really remarkable similarities down to single base pair differences uh, that persisted into age 20 in the daughter um, compared to other known sequences um, in NCBI for lactobacillus crispatus. Um, so that was, um, really uh, beautiful work that Christine did um, and um, um, interesting in terms of um, raises a lot of questions about um, the persistence and those those stable colonizers, I think, um, of different niches. Um, I'll touch very briefly on the placental microbiota because there has been um, a lot of debate in this area and um, the original study um, from the Baylor group that claimed that there was a unique human placental microbiome um, was uh, recently debunked um, in a couple of studies. Um, I know I've met Kevin a couple of times, and it, he has his done sequence. He has his work uh, sequenced here, um, and so he, Kevin Thesis, did a really nice study um, demonstrating or suggesting that you know it was really easy to um, have um, contamination in these studies because they're very low biomass samples, and that um, ideally um, that uh, AmpleCon studies sh should be. Uh, coupled with things like, um, you know, quantitative PCR, culture work, um, or metagenomics um, before um, staking that claim. Um, uh, this is this is some of the um, concerns um, that have been raised about the initial study. Um, but I think, you know, moving forward, some of the things that I would think about as we see more action in this area of literature are to think about, you know, certainly there are differences that we know occur between healthy term births in the placenta and those with obvious evidence of ascending infection from the vaginal microbiota, um, which is more common in certain types of preterm births. And that, you know, really the importance of distinguishing between the uniqueness of a placental microbiome and bacteria that may end up there from, say, homogenous spread or other areas of the body. Um, but really that perhaps these questions would be better framed with, you know, if bacteria do end up there, um, do they play a role in child health? And, you know, is there a role for, say, priming of the immune system um, that others have hypothesized? And I think, you know, the literature is not there yet but to stay tuned on that. Um, and so um, one of the things that I touched on earlier related to the vaginal microbiome um, is our more recent work in ECHO, um, which addresses some or is seeking to kind of address some of the challenges in um, the sequencing pipelines um, for integrating them into kind of these larger population-based studies. Um, and so 
these sources of variation have made um, looking across the literature difficult, but they're really necessary for moving this research forward. Um, this has also um, been challenged by the fact that we have this incomplete understanding of the microbiome and the factors that shape its acquisition and stability. And so we were able to get funding um, to um, identify kind of these, what levers exist, both with regard to technical bias and different bioinformatics selection, um, and to um, attempt to kind of standardize those as we identify them um, in order to make recommendations to ECHO for how to harmonize uh, vaginal microbiota studies um, going forward, because now studies um, have started collecting um, child's uh, bio. Uh, microbiome specimens. Um, and um, the other piece of this that we're doing is to um, try to understand when we look across cohorts, the factors that we'll need to consider in our models that um, we know structure the vaginal microbiota um, that, that may be important when we do this kind of meta-analysis across studies. Um, so we're working with a bunch of great partners. We've got um, Anne Dunlop from Emory, who's got a large cohort of African-American women um, in Atlanta, um, James Gurn and his, his group in both Wisconsin and the MAP cohorts at Henry Ford are working with us. And then Joe Stanford has a large cohort of families from the Salt Lake City and rural areas of the state um, in the study as well. And the goal is to really make recommendations to ECHO um, on these, on kind of the harmonization, the pipeline piece, with this long-term goal of being able to determine the effects of um, maternal microbiota and child health outcomes. Um, and these map really nicely into the four foci of ECHO. So I principally, as I mentioned, work in the preterm birth space, um, but we think that these are important for um, obesity. Um, we've, we're starting to do a little bit of work in that space um, as we look across the life course, um, but also, you know, like Jim Gurn and his cohort has done a lot of work tying um, associations in the gut microbiota with um, asthma and allergies. And then Sarah and her colleagues have uh, started to look into the gut brain axis in the microbiota and its uh, possible associations with neurodevelopmental outcomes. So I think, you know, this is just the beginning of um, of uh, this kind of explosion of, of work, hopefully to interrogate more of the function. Um, and through ECHO, we'll have kind of unprecedented access to um, specimens and participants to be able to do that in a much more powerful way, despite the challenges of, of um, doing that methodologically. Um, and so some of the other ongoing work that we're doing within CHARM, which is the Michigan wide, so working with the other um, institutions in Michigan, um, and investigators there um, are looking at maternal host factors, including inflammation. So um, this recent paper from um, a single cohort at the University of Pennsylvania has suggested that in addition to the vaginal microbiota, we should potentially uh, be looking at um, uh, vaginal cytokines. Uh, this paper demonstrated that there was better discriminatory power in predicting preterm births when they coupled their uh, vaginal microbiota signatures with uh, beta-2 defensin. Um, but we're also um, working in parallel um, at collecting additional uh, children's longitudinal metagenomic samples um, in a COVID supplement that Sarah and I got to look at um, kind of pre-pandemic, post-pandemic uh, dyads um, and getting additional samples collected um, to do metagenomic work on those kids, which hopefully will be useful in a lot of different things uh, for a lot of different analyses, including some work that we're doing with Mike Petriello, who's an environmental toxicologist at Wayne State, um, and Doug Rudin, um, looking at how uh, environmental pollutants um, and uh, microbial derived metabolites that might be mediated by the maternal microbiota um, when we look at um, an outcome like child growth. Um, but this is certainly, um, you know, a multidisciplinary area, area of research, and we're increasingly looking for collaborators to help us um, do all of the really interesting things that um, we now have data to start looking at. But I think, you know, just some last thoughts on um, where I see a lot of this going is really getting back to understanding the function um, and this idea of the microbiome as this potentially modifiable mediator of health um, being the goal um, to do that. You know, we've started to look at factors that play a role in its acquisition and this kind of early life assembly, I think is key and really exciting. 
um, but also integrating host factors. Um, the Human Microbiome Project 2, which has already launched, um, will help, I think, give us um, signposts and, and ideas for how to move that forward into something like ECHO, where we're looking across cohorts, but uh, also things like, you know, using other methods um, that, are, that have started to be used, like neural networks and machine learning, could really help us understand community and dynamics and, you know, co-occurrence between different taxa um, that may be really important in real world, world settings that we, that we can't get at in, when we look at in vitro work or kind of in isolation. Uh, there's been a tremendous increase in publicly deposited data sets, and that is actually one of the criteria for uh, d characterizing uh, this type of sequence data in ECHO is to make them publicly available. But there's also been um, a lot of effort on both HMP as well as March of Dimes, a lot of the studies that they're funding, um, they've created um, public portals for data deposition, and I think those uh, offer a lot of um, opportunity going forward once we, uh, you know, nail down what are the important factors to look at, um, both on the technical side and the, the uh, population uh, factor side. Um, and, you know, and the, you know, the ultimate goal of all of this, of course, is to, you know, really move this forward into being more clinically relevant. Um, and so, you know, we're starting to overcome some of our issues with resolution um, by moving more into the metagenomic realm. Um, but, you know, we're still limited, I would say, to some extent by the identification of rare taxa, particularly in the vaginal niche, in um, uh, publicly available um, uh, reference data sets and libraries. And this curation of libraries, I think, is going to be incredibly important going forward if we're gonna think about something like um, quantitative uh, PCR targets, uh, which could be um, relevant clinically. Um, but I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of movement here and, um, you know, we're, there's, there's a lot more to come on this. Um, so I will wrap up by thanking um, the um, collaborators that I have both within the CHARM microbiome working group, the other ECHO investigators that have contributed data and mentorship, Christine Basis, um, over at the MyCore, as well as Vince Young, Nigel Panis, um, Raina Figueroa from Harvard, um, who's doing some of our sampling, um, and then our team and our funding. And um, thanks so much. I'd be happy to take questions. So thank you, Kim. And so this is great presentation. So we have, uh, I can see one question from the uh, chat box. Maybe we can start from and then why other people uh, think about their uh, question. So the question is, what would be the mechanism for the microbiota persistence in mothers and daughters? Is it the similarity in the immune system that allows some strains to thrive more than the others? So can you see this comment or um, question from the chat box? I can't see the question. I think I understood the question to be, what is our hypothesis about why there may be this persistence um, in the vaginal microbiota um, dependent on delivery mode? And um, the mechanism, I would say, um, we uh, do not understand. I think that what we have seen from um, studies uh, looking at um, the uh, effect of things like probiotics in the gut um, and even in the vaginal niche to a certain extent is that you know there appear to be very stable colonizers that uh, you know occur early in life and that some of them may be difficult to once they take hold um, to be modified and I think that that's important um, to kind of look at parallel uh, systems and models um, because I would say, you know, the vaginal microbiota literature is, is fairly nascent compared to the other areas um, in the microbiome. We certainly need more work in this area. Um, but we do know that, you know, certain taxa tend to co-occur. So lactobacillus enters, in addition to being really unstable, um, it also tends to co-occur with things like Gardnerella. And so it's, it's, you know, when you look at those plots that Kayla Carter in that first slide generated, you know, those women with Lactobacillus crispatus dominant communities, they're incredibly stable. And so um, 
you know, you could see that for some communities that, you know, it's a real stronghold and it's going to take a large perturbation. Um, but then you think about things like, you know, a major infection or where you're taking antibiotics potentially for something else and the degree to which that, you know, may perturb things. Um, and the, in thinking about different timescales in which that's important, um, there was a really nice seminar that Betsy Foxman led last week with some um, of the topics from the um, recent um, Cold Spring Harbor um, seminar, looking at kind of this idea of different timescales and looking and think going back to kind of what we know about um, eco microbial ecology. Um, and I think that that is um, um, important to think about going forward. And to continue to like integrate our, so I'm an epidemiologist, but to continue to look at um, in vitro studies as they come out, um, knowing that there are you know clear limitations when we think about translating that to humans, um, and there's also been a there's a dearth I would say of good animal models both for gestation and for um, vaginal microbiome work because humans um, are you are fairly unique and that their vaginal microbiota is lactobacillus dominant. Um, for the most part. And so that's been difficult to replicate in animal systems. So Jason Bell, um, who's one of my colleagues in OBG WAN has tried to, he's had a few animal models, but they, you know, it's really difficult to get the animals to have lactobacillus dominance. And so it's difficult to study, you know, different um, probiotic treatments when your model system is, um, doesn't clearly replicate like the human system um, in the human host. So the let me quickly read the two questions and then you can uh, address these two questions at the same time. So the one is, so the oral microbiome, so you show some, and then so are you considering including that uh, oral microbiome into your study? This is because, you know, uh, oral microbiome can travel in the body and then uh, that can also, uh, you know, move to the like a vaginal microbiome and so that can be something uh, related to this uh, preterm birth. So, um, and so if you are, so you are considering including that, so that is one. And the, another question is, the, what is the current thinking? So you're thinking on steroid modulation of microbiome. Um, the, Maybe you can start the first one. So first one is sure. oral microbiome yeah. and then um, I think the oral microbiome is really interesting in that it's easy to sample. And certainly like, you know, I think, uh, I believe American Gut is also doing, there's a lot of studies that are doing that. In ECHO, um, very few cohorts have um, adopted that as a measure because there's so many other required elements. If you're interested in what, there are both required and recommended uh, measures in ECHO. They're readily available on the ECHO website. I actually have a slide on um, ECHO resources for people who are interested in working with us because the goal is really to facilitate collaboration. And my experience as a young investigator has been that this is, everyone's very busy, but that there is an incredible amount of collaboration. And some of this is because people have actually put dollars behind the collaboration. And that's the whole goal and vision that Matt Gilman and you know Francis Collins had for ECHO, which has been amazing as a young person. Um, to have access to, because I remember like being a graduate student and hearing about, you know, the close of the National Children's Study and just, you know, being really bummed, um, but um, hopeful that they, it would be re-envisioned. Um, and so, um, and I think that, you know, we've seen that there has been a lot more collaboration going forward, um, which has been great. Um, but um, so we do not have, we, we do not have in our current ECHO studies um, in Michigan, there are, uh, I believe the New Hampshire cohort, um, and, and maybe one other, we recently um, inquired through um, the ECHO network about sites that had done oral microbiome collection. Very few have. Um, I know Andrea Cassie Bushro at Henry Ford is collecting it and they're, they have a brand new cohort of a couple thousand women from um, Metro Detroit that they're enrolling in which they are including it. And I think, you know, when you think about um, known risk factors for preterm birth, including things like um, periodontal disease um, and some of the work that's actually been done here at the School of Public Health. You know, we know that those are important risk factors um, and it's just dedicating um, the time and the um, resources to kind of helping to delineate those mechanistic pathways. But that absolutely makes sense when you think about, you know, known upstream risk factors. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, I, I missed uh, the last part of the, this so question, but uh, so like actually question was, 
relate to what you just mentioned. So the maybe the this uh, you know uh, because you know this oral cavity access is easy and home oral hygiene instruction. So and those can play a role in preventing this preterm birth. So if this oral microbiome and the vaginal microbiome they are uh, they are resemble they resemble and then so um, okay. And then the the last question I can see is that so this is again so the what is the current thinking on steroid modulation of microbiome? So uh, my interpretation is uh, you know how this steroid play a role in uh, cool. changing the microbiome, yeah. the vaginal microbiome. Yeah. So I think um, I think we you know we certainly know that hormones can help to modulate it. We see you know. The fact that we see shifts early in pregnancy that, you know, to my mind speaks, well, what are the, you know, the, physio the, nor the physiologic changes that we know occur in pregnancy are mostly hormonally mediated. We also know that, you know, there are changes in the vaginal microbiota that occur during menstruation. You could see that in that first plot, those plots that Kayla Carter generated for us, um, that, um, that changes can be hormonally mediated. And in fact, um, we've been trying to look at, um, metabolites that may be hormonally um, um, driven or, you know, that are their products of some of this hormonal regulation um, to see, um, to kind of couple those and integrate them into um, uh, vaginal microbial signatures. Because I think what we're beginning to appreciate is that um, we're going to need to couple those vaginal microbial signatures with other uh, maternal host um, uh, biomarkers that the, the the microbial signatures alone will only get us so far. Okay, so uh, if there is no more question, and maybe I I, I want to uh, end with my one last question. So you show the racial difference in uh, this compositional scope compositional difference in uh, vaginal microbiome. And do you think that those are more like a racial, like a more genetic difference, or they are like a behavioral or lifestyle difference? And and also, uh, like, a, are there any like a geographic location difference in micro uh, this vaginal microbiome? Yeah. So I think this area to me is what, as an epidemiologist, really suggested that there was a role for me in this area, and that we're now at a time where we're moving from the folks in microbial ecology and microbiology into um, the need to incorporate epidemiologists into these population-based studies of the microbiome. And as we create larger cohorts, and as we move towards things like ECHO and this kind of cross cohort comparison, we absolutely need to understand why we see these, you know, social, you know, I, it, race is a social construct, right? And so clearly um, that is just, you know, that is a signal, but we need to kind of disentangle um, and look at, well, what are the things that travel with that social patterning. Um, and with ECHO, you know, we have data now to be able to look at that in a much more powerful way. And we have thousands of women now that we're um, now have data on. Um, and I think, um, you know, like that Callahan paper, um, and even was a little bit irritating to me, but even, I think it was the right idea, but it was insufficient in terms of addressing that question, right? Because it failed to consider how different those different cohorts were between Alabama and Palo Alto. Even if you removed their racial identification, um, certainly, you know, there are huge differences in what those populations are probably um, resemble in terms of their underlying differences. And I think, you know, one of the things that was a little bit irritating about the Human Microbiome Project was that, you know, there were clear demonstrative um, differences in geography. But as an epidemiologist, you think about, well, you know, places don't necessarily have, you know, it's, it's probably the people driving these differences, right? And so, you know, is it, are there behaviors? Are there, you know, more, um, are there, I think with regard to something like preterm birth, it's possible that there are different pathways to preterm birth by racial grouping. A lot of the GWAS studies have been, um, you know, not very informative. Um, but that it could be a combination of, you know, certain predispositions in a certain environment or early life exposures, which is, you know, ECHO really has this um, developmental origins of adult diseases kind of lens or framework that it uses. And I think um, looking early on, early in life will help us shed light on that. Okay, so... Uh... Uh, this is uh, 12.55, so uh, I think I have to let uh, people 
go. So if you have any like a class and other meeting at 1 p.m. But actually, I also have a one uh, meeting, so uh, another meeting at one. So I think I have to leave. Uh, uh, one last question I, I can see. So in addition to studying the prevalence and abundance of specific oral microbes, it may be time to study the function of this microbe to understand what they are doing, not only which are there and in what quantities. So any, any thought? Um, definitely. So, uh, I'm sorry, so I will let you, uh, you know, answer to this and then unfortunately I have to leave. So thank, thank you, so you for, uh, for attending this seminar and then, yeah, so have a good day. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, function is where this is all going and this is what we need to do. Um, you know, metagenomics are a lot more, they ha typically have been a lot more expensive than the 16S amplicon sequencing, but we're at a moment where the costs are coming down. I think we're kind of straddling what resources we have for some of these larger studies, but um, methods such as, you know, looking at exact sequence variants um, and like the Dota2 um, uh, pipelines are, are more helpful for um, being able to look at that where um, metagenomic and other omic um, analyses are not possible, but absolutely um, tying the function is absolutely crucial to looking at this in a mechanistic way. Um, I would argue that for risk stratification, you don't really need to demonstrate function, but I do think that you know um, the relative importance for this for health and from even from a funding perspective, um, demonstrating function um, and kind of delineating those mechanistic pathways is absolutely critical. Um, and then I would just like to, to conclude with, I'm looking for graduate students and other folks that are interested in working with us. We have lots of data um, and are really just limited by time. So if you're interested, um, my email is on the last slide at the bottom. Thanks so much.